<laughs> All right. So, hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the next session of the Culturally Competent Conversations for Equity and Belongingness Summit, or the C3EB Summit, day two of the February edition, where we are talking about rebuilding um, economic infrastructure and environmental equity for uh, historically marginalized communities. Quick uh, housekeeping notes before I introduce our next speaker who is going to blow all of our minds because I met him on Clubhouse and he blew my mind. Um, if you do need transcription services, the, it is a, a, this session is available on www.facebook.com forward slash C3EB Summit. That session is uh, transcription enabled, so you will be able to participate in this experience with your closed captioning on. Whether it's you or anybody else that you know that needs it, please don't um, hesitate to go over there. Uh, and you're, you're going to be in the same session as in Hopin. With that being said, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you our speaker for this session, Dr. Brian K. Hodgkins, PhD, who is an assistant professor and um, is, is uh, a part of Think Positionality LLC. And I'll let Dr. Brian tell you more about that, but just a quick bio. Brian K. Hodgkins is the author of an upcoming book, My Black is Exhausted, Forever in Pursuit of a Racist Free World Where Hashtags Don't Exist, and an assistant professor at Texas Tech University within the Educational Psychology, Leadership, and Counseling Department. As a critical race pedagogue, Dr. Hodgkins examines how it anti-Black racism, racial microaggressions, and racial battle fatigue adversely impacts the lifespan of people of African descent. His research has been cited nearly 300 times by leading scholars in the field of higher education and applied by white transracial adoptive parents of Black children through his National Community Village program. Dr. Bryan conducts his How to Reverse Racism training to achieve anti-racist organizational transformation for police departments, corporations, and K-12 school districts. Plus, when on tour, his Facade Podcast Live dissects hip-hop album lyrics with collegians to help them navigate racism on college campuses. He is a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, the 100 Black Men of West Texas, and a Prince Hall Master Mason. Dr. Hodgkins earned his Doctorate of Philosophy in Educational Leadership and Policy from the University of Utah. With all of that being said, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Dr. Brian to the Culturally Competent Conversations for Equity and Belongingness Summit stage and platform. Dr. Brian, the stage is all yours. Welcome, Dr. Brian, to the Culturally Competent Conversations for Equity and Belongingness mm -hmm. Summit stage and platform. Doc Dr. Brian, do you have two windows open with the stage and the backstage by any chance? Dr. Brian, do you have two windows? We are here. I'm hearing an echo of my own voice. And that's usually because you also have the other hop in one on. I've I've muted you because of the echo. So um, one one second. Oh, guess today is a day of technical difficulties. Thank you all again for being patient. Uh, and Dr. Brian is back. 
Yes, today is a day of technical difficulties. A, Thank oh. you all again for being patient. Uh, and Dr. Brian is back. Thank you all. We are um, fixing this right now. Dr. Brian, there is a private chat right next to in the screen. If you can, do you see that? It should be good now, Dr. Bryan. Are we, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Now, when I share again, I'll just share my one, I'll share the same screen. It should be good now, Dr. Bryan. Okay. Are we, can you hear me? Yes. I swear, we were, Dr. Brian and I were talking for 10 minutes and we did not have these issues, go figure. Is it working now? Okay, excellent. Okay, and so what I would like to do- Is it working now? There's the echo again. Okay, excellent. Okay, and so what I would like to do- Is it working now? There's the echo again. Okay, you can hear me now without an echo. Excellent. Okay, let's get to it. Okay, so now that we are ready to go, 
My name is Brian Keith Hoskins. I wanted to speak to everyone today about combating racial battle fatigue as a way of navigating the geographies of racism. And so today what we want to do is have a talk, right? And so this picture is an example of the talk that my grand, that my grandfather had with my father, that my father had with me and that I had with my son, right? And specifically, this talk is about how people of African descent within this context navigate violence and justice, right? And how the juxtaposition of the conversation that we're having is uniquely different than the conversation that our white friends or fathers or colleagues are having with their sons, right? And so to the left, white fathers are having a discussion about uh, the birds and the bees, perhaps dating and marriage, right? Navigating that space while we're having a conversation with our sons about surviving, right? And so I am from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And because I am, I'm mindful of the legacy of the state of Oklahoma. And so the state of Oklahoma is the only state in the union that was given away in a land run, right? And so because of that, there, were, there was an opportunity for historic black towns to be created and thrive, right? And so there has been at least 36 to 50 historic black towns that were mapped, right? And so this is an example of, in the center, all of the historic black towns. And the ones that are in red are still in existence. So you have spaces like uh, Lacey University, uh, Lima, Bowley, Grayson, uh, Tallahassee, right? And then the other ones are no longer in existence, sadly, right? And so as a person of African descent, I grew up with this knowledge that was shared with me about how black people, right? How we move forward in, in even in a segregated Oklahoma, so Oklahoma is created in 1907. And so the first act of the legislature in 1911 is to create segregation, right? And so they have uh, black codes, right? And so Oklahoma is segregated, right? And so because of that, black, historic black towns thrived, right? And so I'm mindful of this legacy and how in those spaces of segregation, what it meant to be black was uninterrupted, right? And so I often ask the question about what does my blackness look like in this uninterrupted state, right? So what is black uninterrupted, right? And I have these pictures here of the Watchmen and Lovecraft Country. So both of these shows were shows that overlapped with the overarching narrative about the city of Tulsa, right? And specifically Greenwood. And so Greenwood, Tulsa, for those of you who don't know, was the home of a race massacre, right? And so if you go there right now, it's, it's 87 miles away, I'm a city, city I was born in. If you go there now, there's one block remaining, right, in Greenwood. And so on at the intersection of Green, of uh, uh, Greenwood, Arch, and Pine, right, there, which is the gap, right? So gap band, for those of you who are familiar, uh, there's just the one block that remains, right? And so on June 1st, 1921, there was a riot. And the other 67 blocks were burned down. Right. And so the narrative of these two stories of these two shows ties into Greenwood. Right. And what why it happened. Right. And how black people were unprotected. Right. And so I'm mindful of those stories that have been passed to me uh, transgenerationally. Right. And so there is there is a sense of, in my mind, what it means to be black and have your ability to move inhibited. Right. So even in a segregated space and place, there were people outside of the community that came there, murdered, assaulted, right, burned down a space that was insulated and that was safe for people of African descent. And so I move forward until the now. Right. And so George Floyd is murdered in 2020. And so I divide 2020 between pre-COVID and post-George Floyd. Right. And so as a person who actively practices anti-racism. I often ask people, who were you before pre-COVID, right? And who are you after the murder of George Floyd? And having a transgenerational discussion with my father about why now, right? So Tamir Rice is murdered, you know, Trayvon Martin is murdered, Mike Brown is murdered, right? And I'm only mentioning uh, black boys and black men because it ties into Emmett Till 
being murdered, right? August 28th, 1955. He's interned September the 6th, 1955. And we have a discussion with my father about where he was when Emmett Till was killed, right? And how it reinforced this notion that there are certain spaces and places that he can't go, right? For fear of his life uh, ultimately being truncated, right? And so with that knowledge that was passed to me, I compared the two, right? Something happened to America that made America say, killing black people is heinous and it needs to end, right? And so, but I'm still mindful that even in this notion of that it needs to end, it has yet to end, right? And because it has yet to end, it still impacts my ability as a black man, right? My father's ability, my father is 84 years old. My son's ability, my son is 24 year old, years old, right? Our ability to still navigate the space that is America, right? And so as we're trying to navigate the geographies of racism, I'm also mindful of anti-blackness, right? And what that looks like and how it is rooted in a history, right? Of the policing of black people, right? And so I'm mindful that black people have never um, been in a space and place and time since 1619, Jamestown, Virginia, when the first Africans uh, were brought to the country, where we've been able to move about without the normative gaze of whiteness hovering above us, right? And so if you get an opportunity, uh, Google New York Times, uh, Kenya, Myra, Ross, this piece, call it what it is, anti-blackness, right? And so the act of inhibiting blackness is anti-blackness, right? The act of watching, the act of believing that black people are violent, are not able to contribute, don't value education, right? We've seen it in its ride Karens. Nationwide, right? White women have been labeled as Karen because they call the police and say, there are black people alive outside and it's disrupting my day. And I need you to come and do something about it, right? That too is a form of anti-blackness. And so two quotes that stood out to this piece. Anti-blackness is more than just racism against black people. It is a theoretical framework that illuminates society's inability to recognize our humanity. Disdain, and it says disdain, disregard, and disgust for our existence. And the second one is anti-blackness describes the inability to recognize black humanity, which warrants gratuitous violence, right? And so these two pictures to the right are a badge of slave catchers, of enslaved Africans, right? And essentially a call for uh, persons to be prepared to deal with black people who are trying to navigate the, the geographies of racism back in that era, space, place, and time, right? And so as we fast forward, as a scholar at Texas Tech University, I am, I believe, one, the only scholar who does critical race theory. So I'm a critical race pedagogue, and I, I center it at, in my work, right? And so critical race theory is the theory that allows for the overlap of centering the narratives of voices of people of color, right? We're mindful that uh, racism is endemic in every facet of society. We are mindful of saying that we use this as a tool to highlight where racism shows up, right? Systemically, um, at the institutional level, to again, inhibit not only blackness, but the ability to move about, right? And so this is a, a snapshot of my research over the last five years, right? So my first, the first piece is navigating, African-American males navigating racial microaggressions, right? Which is rooted in racism and the K-12 space, specifically for black males in a high school. The second piece, black student leaders practicing resistance in the midst of chaos, applying transgenerational activist knowledge to navigate a predominantly white institution is more about how black student activists and leaders use their voice on campus and in the community to highlight how they experience racism, right? And then the final one is black women students at predominantly white universities, narratives of identity politics, well-being, and leadership mobility, right? And so it's the first time that I use the term gender noir racial battle fatigue, right? Which highlights how black, because they're, they are black and they are women, that they experience a different type of racial battle fatigue that is routed through that lens of what it means to be woman, right? And how they use leadership uh, ways to help them navigate, right? And ultimately those three articles have one thing in common. And that is that the cumulative impact of the 
racial microaggressions, overt, uh, covert racism that they experienced, right? It ended up giving them racial battle fatigue, right? And so the work of Dr. William Smith, uh, who created racial battle fatigue, he, he narrows it down to the specific definition that I want to share with each of you. And it is the cumulative result of a natural race related stress response to distressing mental and emotional connections. These conditions emerge from constantly facing racially dismissive, demeaning, insensitive, and or hostile racial environments and individuals, right? And they are essentially, there are, there are three adverse outcomes to racial battle fatigue that are triggered by mess, right? <laughs> so sometimes I remember my grandma always telling me, you know, stay out of that, stay out of that mess. And I didn't realize that, <laughs> that it was it was woven into mess as an acronym, which is mundane, extreme environmental stress, right? That people experience. And so in the three ways that you experience battle fatigue, there's going to be a psychological response to your body. Right. And so th this list uh, to your mind, this list is truncated. Right. So it, it is abbreviated. There are if you Google it, there's, there's more to it. And so you may have flattened confidence. Right. You may experience depression, uh, chronic anxiety. You may experience frustration, uh, shock or anger. Right. But then there's a physiological response. And so you may have diminished mortality. Right. So we realize that it, that being immersed in racism uh, for extended periods of time, truncates life of people of color, right? So you may have disrupted sleep. You may have high blood pressure. You may, your body may respond with headaches, uh, increased heart rate, or you may even have panic attacks, right? And then there's the behavioral response, right? And so your behavioral response is bound in what you've experienced, right? And so I'll give you an example. At the University of Utah from 2008 to 2013, I was the only person of African descent in the educational leadership and policy PhD program. And so during that time that I was there, I heard the N word be said three times in class. Right. And so it was never said directly to me uttered. So in one class, it was a, a young white woman who said that she's going to it's going to be difficult for her to be involved in social justice work because she needs to be forgetful of how she was raised because her parents were racist, right? She says specifically, I remember going to the um, pool and it being closed and her father, her asking her father, why can't we go swimming? And him responding that we can't because of that damn N word, Martin Luther King holiday, right? Excuse the, the curse, but it, it applies, right? And so in hearing that I stopped and I looked around and I was waiting for someone to intervene, right? To at least, at least acknowledge and intervene and no one did. Right. And so I'm angry. A conversation ensues. Right. And so I had to end up asking the professor, can I not come back to class? So I completed my work by sending it in. Right. But every time I would walk up to that space and place the building that I had the class in. Right. I, I experienced trauma like my chest would get tight. Right. And, and it would it would be anxiety rushing over me, which I, I immediately thought about what happened, what was said. I would dream about it. Right. And so every time I dream, I dreamt about it. I would re-traumatize myself through the experience that I had while I had while I had it while I was sleeping. Right. So I woke up more tired than I was before I went to sleep. Right. And so those are some of the behavioral responses that I experienced. Right. Societal disengagement. So I, so I disengaged. From, I didn't want to go to class, right? I, I didn't want to be involved. I didn't want to meet with my professors, right? Those were, were, were a detriment to me intellectually because I was being socialized to be a professor, right? But I, I withdrew. So instead of fighting, I got to the point where I wanted to flight, right? So then I, the whole time I was seeking a cultural congruence. I want to find myself, people that I can identify with who, when I spoke in slang, they didn't think I was unintelligent. Where if I wore a hoodie or sagged my pants, they didn't think I was a gang member or want to be involved in violence, right? Where I would be accepted in my authentic self in black spaces, right? Or around people of color in those spaces, right? I, I found cultural congruence, right? And again, location avoidance is what I experienced, right? And so I want you to think about this personal consideration. And this is the question. What are the most racially safe and threatening spaces within your work environment and why, right? So think about that as we, as I continue with the conversation. 
And so we've identified what racial battle fatigue is, right? And so let's talk about navigating it in the now. And so as a person of African descent, I'm mindful that my elders, right, spend their, the part of their lives helping black people or people of African descent navigate the geographies of racism in America. To the left is a, a color picture of Harriet Tubman, right? And so when I saw the picture, I was like, oh my goodness. I just watched Harriet, right, on HBO. And so I'm like, man, I had to use this picture today, right? Because her whole life was dedicated, her adult life, to helping enslaved Africans navigate the geographies of racism towards freedom. Fast forward to the 1940s, where we have the Negro Travelers Green Book, right? And these are different iterations of it that were given to persons of African descent to use to navigate the geographies of racism, again, in America, in spaces and places like in Oklahoma, there are places like Kellysville that are sundown towns. So if you Google sundown towns, Oklahoma, you'll find several sundown towns where people of African descent were told, you don't wanna be there after dark, right? Because it, it would lead to the your life being truncated, right? And so I'm mindful of that. And so in being mindful, the process what I'm sharing with you now is, is a brief cartography clinic, right? So in research with students, I've asked them, I've given them the knowledge about how the geographies of racism need to be navigated. And these are two examples of how it has been navigated in the past, right? And so in the research, I may give them a prompt. And this is a prompt that I would share with any of you, but this is just a prompt within the context of higher ed. And it reads like this, map your college education journey from when you started until now. Include the people, places, spaces, obstacles, and opportunities. Draw your relationship with how you experience race and college, where it overlaps and separates. Include what works or what doesn't work for you. Use various colors to show different feelings. Use symbols like lines and arrows or even words. These are just recommendations. Be expressive. If you don't want to draw, use your visual, use a, something visual like a Venn diagram. We will discuss what you create afterwards. Right. And so this is the example of what I created of my undergraduate space and place and time. So at the top left, it says Oklahoma, first generation college going student. I didn't have a computer. I had to work a job to get my degree. Right. So I didn't know I was poor until I went to Southern Methodist University, Dallas, Texas, which is still an affluent area and space. Right. So this first picture of the this my Dr. Willock was my professor. Right. She was the first white woman that I met that got it right, that understood race and how it manifests on college campuses, right? And so if you go to the right, Hughes Tree, there's a, a picture of Africa. So there was a space that black students sat in, right? I, I would never see anybody after three o'clock, between nine and three, only people of African descent sat in that space and place. And there's a place where we gathered and talked with each other, shared our, our lives about how we're doing well or how we weren't in school, right? Then there's the, my fraternity house. And so if you see biology and algebra, those have red arrows. That means I was terrible in those, <laughs> right? And so, but if you go to the center, in the center there are white women, white pro white professors, white fraternities, specifically Alpha fraternity, right? And so those, I couldn't penetrate whiteness on my campus, right? And so because of that, as an outlet, play video games, PlayStation, Sega Genesis with my frat brothers who were black or very varied races of, of males, in Dallas and Oklahoma City, right? And so I, we were in Highland Park. I'll give you an example. In Highland Park, there was a time when we were pulled over because I ran track. There was a time when we were pulled over uh, with our SMU uh, sweats on and they had to call our coach to verify that we actually went to SMU. To me, that was a moment of, let me show you my free papers, right? I could have been in the Harriet Tubman area, era of, I'm free. Let me show you my papers. I'm not a threat. I'm a student at SMU. Right. And so I spent a lot of time at Rare Bird Mall, in the library, and ultimately that's me graduating at the bottom. Right. So the green arrows are the things that insulated me, that made me feel like I belonged and I deserved to be there. Right. But the red things were outside of those. And so it was difficult too. But what I was doing in my college experience was navigating the geographies of racism. And even though I'm still I'm publishing and I have five research papers coming out in 2021, and they're still about how students of African descent navigate the geographies of racism, right? And so now that we know that what it is and how it manifests itself in the now, I wanna give you an example of how to track your racial battle fatigue, right? And this is just a prompt 
for any of you because you may not even know that you're experiencing or suffering from racial battle fatigue, right? This, this may be a new term to you. And so I would give you, and if I were advising you, this is an example of a prompt, right? And it is this, for the next 30 days, track your personal behaviors concerning racialized anxieties about and responses to people, places, spaces, and time, right? And so how do you move through the day? Consider the link between racism and your race-related stress. Be mindful about how racism oppressively limits your space, time, energy, and motion, right? So Chester creates this notion of racial microaggressions, and he calls that STEM, right? So I, I repeat that. Be mindful of how racism oppressively limits your space, time, energy, and motion. In response, list mediating escapism factors that can distract you from the racism you experience, whether it be exercise, reading, or, and or applying imagination, right? And so at the end of 30 days, you should be able to know what worked, right? Versus what, what didn't, and basically repeat the cycle, right? And so I'm mindful too, that me watching George Floyd die, what was, that was extremely traumatic. But what was also traumatic to me was the fact that he was calling out for his mother to intervene to help him navigate death in that instance. I didn't realize till like two months later that his mother has already, was already deceased, right? So even, even though he knew that his mother was deceased, he was still calling out for her to help him, right? To, inter to intervene and stop his death, right? And so after that, I had 17 conversations with white colleagues. I wrote them all down where they asked me, what should we do as white people? How, how, do, we, how do we help? stop this, right? How do we be allies, right? And so me having to get into that conversation was extremely exhausting, right? So I, in, in my mapping through my journaling, I realized I slept more. I didn't eat as much. I stopped working out, right? I, I, was, I was distracted by anything. I couldn't focus, right? Because my racial battle fatigue was high, right? Which led to me doing two things to deal with it, creating our how to reverse racism training that We've already, in, in six months, we already have a demand that I can't really meet, <laughs> right? Because it's expanding, because so many people are wanting to learn and deal with racism, right? And then I penned my, my book that is, that is coming out, right? My Black is Exhausted. And so it is, those two things were um, cathartic to me. And so I'm mindful of it, right? And so when I was asked by Dr. AJ to come and have a conversation, uh, about this topic, I had to take advantage of it because I'm I'm mindful too that racism kills. And I want each of you who are listening to my voice to be mindful that you may be experiencing racial battle fatigue, right? And I just want to offer a way for you to be able to identify, track it, and create a way for you to uh, better deal with it, right? And so I'll stop there and stop sharing my screen. Wow. Thank you for that, Dr. Hodgkins. And I know I've heard this before in the talk that you did for me on Clubhouse in our club, but it, it every time I just learn something new from it, a new nuance that, that I need to kind of consider. And um, so there's a if anyone has questions for Dr. Hodgkins, please drop it uh, into the comments uh, so that I can um, relay them to Dr. Hodgkins because I did make him close his window because of the echo. <laughs> um, so we do have a couple of um, comments so far, Dr. Hodgkins. Corrales said, thank you, Dr. Hodgkins, for this important presentation, constantly facing racially dismissive, demeaning, insensitive, and or hostile racial environments and individuals. Um, Faustina said, speaking on it, need to read those. I don't know what those are, Faustina. Um, Lenny said, this exercise in awareness is so valuable. Faustina said, I hear that, Dr. Hodgkins, I had to take a mental health day after that. And I think she was talking about um, Mr. George Floyd's lynching and murder. Um, Corrales said, wow, just wow. 
Leslie said extremely powerful and real. And, um, you know, Dr. Hoskins, one thing I did want to do is ask you a very pointed question, actually, um, especially given the rise in um, anti-Asian crimes against mm -hmm. elderly folks that are rising right now um, because of certain types of rhetoric used by the previous administration, as well as the sense of being perpetual outsiders. To, and, 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 and just to kind of also reframe that, um, those who have had the advantage of coming to this country as selective immigrants after 1965 don't or may not realize the role that the civil rights movement played in us even being allowed into this country, right? So we really stand on that foundation, but we don't know that because it's not taught in our schools in the way that it should be. So how, for me as somebody in the space who is Asian, you know, Indian American, Asian American, working on, of the, uh, on these issues, and for anybody else too, when we are talking about these inter-community issues, how do we go about explaining to people in a way that they really get it that in order to address any of these other inequities in these other communities, we first have to understand Black and Native American history. And that, that, that anti-racism work is, is, is based in exactly what you said about anti-Blackness earlier. Um, and, and, you know, and of course in the indigenous populations with, as one of our speakers earlier today said, the paper genocide and, 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 and anti-Native American rhetoric as well. So long question, but at the end of the day, what can those of us who are, who have not been a part of this story for 450 years and who've only joined it in the last 50 or so years, how do we go about educating ourselves and others about it? Right, so that, that's a good question. And, that, and it has two answers. So the first part is we have, as groups of people of color, we have to look inward, right? And so I'm that there's research that says that the darker hue wise, phenotypically, a person appears, the greater amount of racism that they experience. Right. And so it, I have as a professor, I have a lot of access to students, administrators and staff and other faculty members. Right. And so even though they're not persons of African descent within their groups of people of color, the darker amongst them experience racism within the racialized group, right? And so we need to have conversations within group around, okay, how do, how do darker Samoans, uh, Tongans, uh, Cherokee, um, Cambodians, how, how do the darker amongst us in our groups experience racism, right? Because there are people of color who have internalized racism, right? And they, they have a colonialized mind still. And so when they look at themselves and they look at the darker amongst them, they see them from a deficit perspective. And so we have to have, that's the first thing. We have to have a, we have to look inward to have an honest conversation about who we are with each other inside our racialized groups and how racism plays out in those spaces. And then we have, an, we have to have look outward to have a conversation about what is solidarity even, right? It's, it's more than a tweet, right? It, it's more than um, a post on Facebook. Right. What what is solidarity to the group that is being oppressed? Right. And so I'm looking to Asian communities as a person of African descent. I'm looking to them to tell me what to do to help them. Right. Specifically, because me being on me being on social media so I can retweet what's happening. But that's not really helping them. That, I don't believe my tweeting is going to stop people from assaulting them. Right. And so because, like you said, the previous administration has framed covid as a Chinese occurrence, right? In the same way that previously Ebola was framed as an African occurrence, right? So when people associate disease with a racialized group of people, they're gonna respond in ways to separate, further separate themselves from those people, 
because they're going to think falsely that my proximity to these people is going to take my life, right? And so we have to have a conversation across racialized groups around what does that mean for us to be in solidarity, right? And so I've had the benefit of having conversations with people on Clubhouse who are of Asian descent about not only the hostile relationship historically between people of African descent and Asian descent in America, but how, how can we hear that in the real time rather people of African descent contributing to raising awareness of African of people of Asian descent is receiving racism. How how can we help right so we can heal together and we can help each other. And so that I think that's that's part of it. We have to look inward and then we have to look outward. I love that. I love that. Um that is that is the journey that I'm on uh you know and I it's reaffirming and re you know re-energizing to to hear that this journey starts with every single one of us as an individual. Um, so Kerala's had two questions. Mm -hmm. One is where, and they're related. Uh, so I'll read both at the same time. Where can we gather more resources on this topic? And how do we educate others with those materials? So there are, so Google Scholar, if you type in racial battle fatigue, there are I want to say a hundred articles about it. So I, I published on it because so the precursor to racial battle fatigue is racial microaggressions. Mm -hmm. Right. So because racial microaggressions are subtle, right? So when I, I had a student once tell me while I was giving a lecture, uh, Dr. Hoskins, you don't have to speak like that. You could just be yourself. <laughs> right? Which I interpreted as them hearing me as intellectual, they didn't associate that with my blackness. Like those those two things couldn't go together for them. So being myself, speaking my normal way. Is it is in an unintellectual way to them, right? And so Google Scholar it provides a wealth of information. Um, and so how do you use that information? It is it is key to be able to take people up and down levels of abstraction, right? In a way where they get it, right? So I, I'm we had a, a anti racism summit here in Lubbock, and so I spoke to eighty. 10 to 12 year olds, which is my hardest demographic. I'm most intimidated by 10 to 12 year olds, <laughs> right? But what we ended up doing was taking, because I'm a Marvel comic junkie, was taking the villains in Marvel, so Thanos, right? And uh, Venom and saying, okay, th these are manifestations of colorism, of uh, over racism, of racial microaggressions, right? And we know we, wouldn't, we wanna teach you young people how to be anti-racist superheroes. So this is what it is. Here's how you do it. What would your superpower be, right? And so children are very insightful, right? When you speak to them at the level that they're at. And so I think that there are, there are a variety of ways where you can take the information and, and apply it, right? And the third way is, so for the work that I do with our How to Reverse Racism training, and this, this is not a plug, but hire someone to come into your organization to speak to you about the adverse impacts of racism, uh, how it manifests itself, Right. And so we we've already been doing since July. We just started in July. And so even though I've been doing I've been researching this topic since 2007 in a way that it is consumable by everyone. So we we're at four K-12 schools. We're at three universities. We're doing police police forces. We're doing uh, superintendencies. Right. Working with university presidents. And so it is that we have a nuance that is contextual. Right. And so I'm mindful that your context, how you experience racism in your context it's going to be different if you work for the Dallas Mavericks versus if you work for, you know, so-and-so elementary. And so th those are just three examples of, of how you can get the information applied to people that are in your communities. Thank you for that. And I know Dr. Hodgkins said that he wasn't plugging himself, but uh, I'm going to plug Dr. Hodgkins. Um, sorry, Dr. Hodgkins, uh, I have to, because um, if this is the kind of training that your organization or any community spaces that you're a part of needs, um, this is the person who's done the research, who has done the academic research since 2007 and has worked in so many different community spaces across the board to help people realize and you know realize the realness of this in a very digestible and easy to understand way so heck yeah i'm gonna plug you 
um, please reach out to Dr. Hodgkins if that's the kind of training that you need. In addition, Dr. Hodgkins' book um, called My Black is Exhausted, Forever in Pursuit of a Racist Free World Where Hashtags Don't Exist. Please go get that. Dr. Hodgkins, could you tell us a little bit more about the book and where we can find it, please? And so I had a conversation with my son who asked me, Daddy, what's your greatest fear? And I said, it's becoming a hashtag, right? So George Floyd's death really impacted me, right? And seeing his daughter after that, I don't think she's aware of the gravity of what happened yet, right? Because she's still young. And so it got me to thinking about how have Black people use social media, specifically hashtags, to chronicle four areas. So to to mourn, right? So black people haven't been allowed to publicly mourn the loss of our lives, right? In the United States at any time. So social media has allowed that, right? So through hashtag, hashtag Black Lives Matter, right? So black mourning, uh, black excellence, right? So hashtag black excellence, right? Uh, bringing black voice, right? So the Black Lives Matter movement, we've used social media to say, meet us here in this city at this time. So we're gonna march together, right? So black protests, right, and that validates our voice and black protests, right? And so uh, there are, I got plenty of examples of Karen situations where had I just told you, you might not have believed me, but because I have a cell phone, I can show it to you, right, and post it, right? So we're looking at black mourning and black excellence, bringing black voice, amplifying it, and um, this notion of black mobility to protest, right? So that's, that's what the book is about. The arc of that from 2010 to 2021, Right. And, and it's it's there's a smatterings of my life story and how I experienced it. Right. And how in transgenerational narratives. Right. So I'm, I'm mindful of talking to persons that are eight years old, that are 10 years old. And my father, who's 84. So I talked to him and his homies uh, <laughs> frequently. Right. About, you know, where they were when Dr. King was killed, um, about how when my son voted in this election right out of almost, right out of college, almost. Right. And how my father graduated in 1956 and he couldn't vote for nine more years, right? And how he feels about voting, right? So he, he feels a way about it, right? Because it was taken away from him. And so the book can be found at www.mbiebook.com, which is abbreviated for My Black is Exhausted, book.com. So it's www.mbiebook.com. And so you can pre order it. So it, it'll be out this summer. And so I'm looking forward to some some rollouts. Right. The goal is to interview persons uh, who have experienced exhaustion as it relates to race. Right. And, and what that looks like. And so hopefully if there are any one of you who have people who have podcasts, uh, the goal is to, for me to be on podcast. Uh, and, and we're going to start a podcast called Exhausted. Right. And so where we just have these discussions about what that looks like um, across different socioeconomic status across different levels of education, about where, we're, where we live. There's one thing that I didn't say in the presentation is that if you look at the research, a lot of us have been taught that when we get money, leave, get out the hood, right? And go to a space and place where there are ultimately less of us. What the research is saying is that when you move into a white neighborhood or a space where there are a few people that look like you, you're increasing your race of battle fatigue, <laughs> right? And so there may be only one of you of you in your neighborhood or two families that look like you, but 98% of the other families are white, right? So you're placing yourself into the normative gaze of whiteness, right? And so when you see, all, prior to the election, seeing all the driving up in my neighborhood, seeing all those Trump flags, like that, that was having an impact on me, right? So I, I placed myself in harm, in harm's way, right? Un, under the guise of I'm doing better because I moved out the hood, right? And so just, just be mindful that when we are in spaces that there are less of us, we increase the likelihood that we are traumatized even more. Okay. And then our last question, just in the interest of time and the next uh, session as well, mm -hmm. is um, so Leslie asked, in your opinion, what is the best way to support the Black Lives Matter movement as a Latinx person whose community is also oppressed so that understands in some way, but knows that the experience is not the same, in other words, as a non-white person. So I think um, basically as a non-white person who is also oppressed, but a non-black person, 
what is the most effective way um, to support the larger movement beyond just standing with the Black Lives Matter movement? Right. So part of it is, so there are a couple of things. So you can donate to any organization that is anti-racist. You can donate to any Black Lives Matter organization in your city. Uh, you can dedicate your time. Like you, you can use the resources of your organization so if, or, or your employment place. So if you're, if you're an attorney, you may say, okay, I want to do pro bono work in the black community or to support Black Lives Matter. Right. So people, for instance, people are protesting. People are being arrested in protests. You may say, if you're arrested in protests, come to me. We're going to take care of you. Right. And, and help you with that situation. Uh, and because there's a there's a unique experience that uh, Afro Cuban, Afro Latino people have. Right. Or Latinx. Sorry. People have. I would I would be a community with those people because they have a nuanced experience of what it means to be uh, of African descent and to be of Latin descent. Right. Uh, so those are just some ways, you know, you, you don't want to be on the periphery. You want to. I mean, when I say look, look inward, look into yourself and say, I want to help and then reach outward to say, hey, how can I help? Like I did with the Asian community. I'm not a person of Asian descent, but I've asked for permission to participate in their struggle. And I've asked what is the best way to do that so I don't be in a space I'm not supposed to be in. Right. And so th those are just a couple of examples of how you can participate. Absolutely. And I think, you know, to kind of um, summarize that a little bit, it really is, though, you know, going to those who ha who are experiencing these lived experiences and not putting the burden on them to educate you, but really asking them, how can you meet their needs? And what is it that they need from you? And really listening to them and following their thought, uh, their thoughts and their um, needs on it, instead of, regardless of where we come from, instead of making assumptions that stem from where we come from. Would absolutely. that be a fair thing to say? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so with that, Dr. Hodgkins, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have so many more questions for you that I will be um, asking you in the clubhouse room tonight because uh, this is um, there's just so many more um, nuances to this that that that, you know, I know in the interest of time, you were very kind and um, we don't get to cover in this 50 minute session here. So again, um, if you are on Clubhouse, definitely do join us and uh, we will be back in just about six minutes uh, with our final speaker for the day before my closing remarks, uh, Sean Wanzo, who is going to be um, speaking about the economic um, gap and why it is still so wide and why it continues to widen from the diversity, equity, and inclusion strategist perspective. So I hope you join us for that in just about six minutes. And Dr. Brian, I am so deeply honored to know you and I am so thankful that um, you came here with all of these insights and all of this research and all of this just powerful, powerful, powerful messaging um, to grace all of us so that we can learn and grow together and so that we can be better and do better um, on this incredibly critical issue. So from the bottom of my heart, and I know, I know I'm speaking for every single person in the audience, from the bottom of all of our hearts, thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, when you asked, I was, I was willing to do it and excited about it. I mean, ultimately, I want the, the legacy of my work to be that the information that I researched and shared help elongate people's lives. And so, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to talking to you uh, with the other speakers on Clubhouse tonight. If, you, if people get a chance, you can follow me on all social media. It's at DRB Hodgkins. That's simple enough. And I'll also put that in the chat. Um so that people can follow you and get in touch with you. And so with that, we will be back in just a few minutes with our next speaker. Thank you so much, Dr. Hodgkins. Thank you, have a good evening. You too.